find something and do it in full. Strangely, I, I've always liked to look at pictures. You could imagine that I would like that. And in California, we used to invite people over to our loft, and anyone that came could show work. And they were, ended up being famous photographers there. It wasn't the intent, but a carpenter could show work too. So when we moved to Virginia, we started doing it in our yard and very close to here. And that exploded. And, and we, we quickly learned that we didn't want people to talk. We just wanted them to show pictures. I think the, the first person to show was 20 minutes on the first frame telling us how important that photograph was of a man sitting on his porch. So we, after that, we never let anyone talk again. But it kept going until it got so big. I think there were 500 people camped in my yard in the country the last time we did it. While that's happening, Charlottesville was evolving to, to plant trees on the downtown, to renovate an old theater, to have an outdoor pavilion that's covered with, for concerts. So we woke up to live in the perfect town for the, the first real photo festival in the United States. Where, when I mean that, it's, like it's, con it's concise, it's European in style, you can walk to everything. But we didn't ever do it for uh, that. We did it for other photographers. We did it for the tribe. This is about bringing everyone together and sharing photographs. So the concept of looking is what it's always been about. Looking at work and sharing it. And also getting out of some of the, we're so competitive, photographers are, that this is three days where we don't compete. We, we just look and talk to each other and share. For look three to move forward and survive, but we we have to take the next step. It's it right now. It's still the the child of me and Jessica and Andrew and Jenna were our first people, and they're going to move on in their lives. So we now what we have to do is see if we can make it sustainable. It's time to take a breath and then reevaluate it, and it will continue. But just so you know, intentionally. It's look three, the fourth year is look between, and that's only emerging photographers, so nobody like me says a word. That's for a hundred photographers that are coming out. That's next year. And then in 2015, we'll have another look three, and then by then, we'll have reevaluated how to keep it sustainable. The problem for me is if it changes, if it becomes commercial, if it's a trade show, I have no interest. It has to be about photography. I, I certainly didn't create, get involved with Look 3 so I could have myself on the stage, but I'm very happy about it because it's fun to celebrate your life as a photographer. And The Lions is my latest project. It might be my last project. I, I, I work so hard on what I do. I haven't come up for air in two years. I, I spent 18 months in the last two years with Lions in the Serengeti, and that project was planned for five years. So you, I, I've been with National Geographic a, a good portion of my career, but I didn't go there because of that. I went there because they would let me work a long time. Because it's all I really care about is finding a subject and just obsessing over it. And that's what's happened with Lions. I basically thought, okay, the greatest cliche of all the wildlife is the Serengeti lion. And so, but they're endangered. Lions are in big trouble. No one really knows it. All predators are, but lions, the Tanzania where there's a stronghold, has got the, one of the fastest growing human populations on earth. So what I did is I served as the hook. I went out and made incredible natural history pictures with new angles, very close, using infrared lights little helicopters, little robots, all lots of technology, but it's not about technology at all. It's about getting closer to their lives. They're dangerous, so how do you get so close? I had no barriers between me and them. And so we, we just finished that, and because I'm one of the photographers celebrated this year, I knew I could have an exhibit. And even like four or five years ago, I, knew, I saw this homeless church, the Haven, and I thought, that's the perfect place for my work, because I'm not a religious person, but I totally worship the earth. 
So I try to always, with my pictures, I want people to see it and think like that. I want them to think that this is something that we have to take care of. This is, this is the earth. That, we have to be stewards of the earth. So a church really helps that. I, I once exhibited a big tree in a church in Perpignan, and I saw the audience doing exactly what I hoped. They just sat there in awe, and that's what I'm trying to do here with this exhibit. There's a lot of black and white. And I've done that before with a scientist I work with, which I basically, but when you, when we want to say, how did I convince National Geographic? I don't convince them. I don't give them the choice. So every picture I took of that scientist was in black and white. So there was no way for it to be color. Of course, you can convert digital photography to black and white and color. That's easy. But I shot all of that black and white in infrared, which can't be converted well to color. I made it a trap. Because they do surveys and they find that National Geographic people don't like black and white that well. I assure you that will not be the case in this. Because this black and white that we're showing is how we got inside them. It was using infrared lights at night, which they can't see, so it doesn't disturb them. The eyes are still dilated as if it's a dark night, which is really important. They have these vacuum cleaners to suck in light because they hunt at night. It was super important to do this. It was the only way. But it wasn't a, an aesthetic choice. We brought all the technology that we could figure out into this, like a microcopter, a little helicopter with electric blades, a tank that had two cameras, one shooting video, one shooting. Still, that was the other thing I would say. That, my assistant, who's become a very good videographer, shot video simultaneously all the time. So in the exhibit, there's a lot of video as well as these big pictures. But it's not at all about the technology. That's what's funny. You, I was trying to use that just to get on the lion's level. You don't want to be looking down at the king of the beast. You want to get super close, and that way you don't get bitten because it's a robot. And they never attacked the robot. They, they were always cautious about it. Um, and I, if I continue working, we have, a, we built a special car for that project that we got in England. It was a pickup truck, a Land Rover pickup truck. We shipped it to Kenya, converted it to a Lion car, which was all open with infrared lights and had power so we could do our downloading and stuff like that. And the tank and the, so if I continue, I'll work in Serengeti. I'm not going to go to another place in my life to work outside of San Getty. I, I get obsessed with something and I can't move on. But I am, I will say, I'm very tired. I've been at this a long, long time. My body's worn out. I am thinking about growing tomatoes. <laughs> well, everyone thinks I can't. And I don't know if I can. But I do know that I I don't know what's the next mountain I'm going to climb. You know, Lions was a big target out there. And once I did that, I, I, now I'm, what I'm doing is I'm going through postpartum. You know, I'm like, I, I just don't know what I could get excited about next. So what I'm trying to tell the world is I'm not taking the next assignment that come, the phone rings. Whatever I do next will be a very, very careful decision. Certainly, gravitating to National Geographic was about having a huge audience, and having the and that was a big discovery for me to see that my photography could be more than entertainment. And when it when I saw that, it just kind of evolved. And I did a project with Jane Goodall that had an effect. It got to Congress and it made some changes in laws for chimpanzees. And that's very different than people reading your story and enjoying it. That's an actual change you can mark. And 13 national parks came out of the work that we did in Central Africa. Uh, they're threatened, of course, but the boundaries got built and nobody's logged inside of them. So the battle never ends. Now we have elephants in incredible crisis. And I've done 20 years of work on elephants. So I have a book coming out in the fall that it's not about elephants being killed. It's about how smart and how sentient and how caring and how incredible they are. So. 
how can we kill them for their teeth? So I have all this stuff, and the trees the same way. It's a lot of things like that, but the, certainly the megatransect in the parks that came has to be the, the mark. I'm a photojournalist, and uh, I just happen to be very comfortable in the wilderness. I'm more comfortable sleeping outside than I am inside. I, I'm not afraid of animals. I, I can read them. I'm very, very focused with, and it was gorillas and apes that I saw that, that you can have this nonverbal communication. So, and I love the challenge, you know, the, the challenge of making evocative images that are often been seen as cliches. I mean, I, I, you have to use telephoto lenses if you do wildlife, but that's not the pictures that I find successful is when I've gotten a, a complicated street frame of apes or elephants or something like that, and they're very hard to come by. So I've enjoyed the challenge of it. But, but mainly I, when I found that I could do it well, I, I love the environment, and I had this huge voice. So you, that gives you some kind of other power. You know, it's like, it's the juice. And, and I, I've lived it in full. And so I don't, the cool thing is it's not about me. So I can say, oh, I'm working for the lions now, or I'm working for the elephants, or I'm work, you know, working for the trees. And it gives you something very powerful to motivate you. I don't care about photography for the sake of it. You know, I, I want to know what it can do. And that's my bigger stage. But this is a place where we come together and celebrate each other and, and share. And I like all kinds of photography. But when I'm personally going out there, I'm trying to speak to the whole planet, not to a community of photographers. I wouldn't know how to say if it's successful or not. It was an intent that I had for a long time. Because I built a website when I thought I should at, in 2000, and I put all this stuff on there for people to, to ask me questions because I never had time to answer them. And I never touched it again for 12 years. So that got kind of out of date. <laughs> Meanwhile, I was thinking, wait a minute, we're putting all this content on here. Let's see if we can get a dollar. You know, can we get a cup of coffee out of the content? And, and so I decided, long ago that I would create a, some kind of step that you had to pay something to see the work. And so we made an app and put kind of a, it's kind of a body of work app. Um, I, you know, there's nothing that's hugely successful, but it was satisfying. The problem is when you do that, you step into another technology and it, you're chasing yourself. You've got to update it. You've got to go retina. You've got to add stuff. It's it takes management that I'm not all that good at, but I'm very happy with it. I, I prefer it. I want people to see the work. The other side of it is I, I couldn't stand the way the work looked on the internet. I couldn't stand the stuff. You know, I can't stand ads and sh crap. So with an app, you can control the way people see your work. And you can, you know, they can't, it can't be cropped. It's got the caption that I intend. So it's. It's very much me presenting the work that I want, but, you know, it was an experiment. I really resisted social media because I'm very private, and I couldn't understand it, you know, but my kids, everybody around me was, and then I found Instagram. Jenna, who, who works with me too, not just Look3, and Chloe is a young Look 3 person. They said, why don't you try Instagram? And I loved it from the moment that I touched it. But I also saw it as a way to put the lions out. We shot 200,000 pictures. We're publishing 13. So I thought, and I, because it's square, I like that. Because I don't shoot squares. I shoot rectangles. And I used fil heavy filters. Because I, I felt like I was presenting the work in Instagram as a one only. It'll never be shown that way anywhere else. And it's, and then I, but I do watch the people that look at it, and it, it's crazy who's out there. You know, it's, so I enjoy it. That's never changed in my life. It's find something 
and do it in full. You know, don't run around. Find something you care about. And if you focus on that, you, the doors will open. I, it's just that simple. If you're, if you're photographing something that everyone else is doing, your work gets lost. But if you photograph something that's yours in your backyard that you can have your own voice about, you'll get attention. People see that. That's what all of us look for. It's not, it's not about subject matter. It's did the photographer connect with a subject and bring us into a new place with it? And that's something you can do without money. That doesn't have to do with National Geographic or the New York Times. It has to do with connecting with your subject. And people say to me, well, how can I have your life? And I say, well, you start with something that you can afford to do and do it really well.